Hello and welcome to R for Reproducible Scientific Documents, Knitter, R Markdown, and Beyond. Uh, this is a screencast version of our library's workshops that we run at Rutgers University Libraries. Uh, I am Ryan Womack. I am data librarian at the New Brunswick Libraries on the New Brunswick campus of Rutgers University. Um, and so this calendar is, is focused on things happening at Rutgers New Brunswick. However, our uh, web-based events are open to all. Um, so if you are interested in these, you, you can take advantage of those. Um, our calendar is available. I'm going to pop up some links uh, there in just a moment. Uh, but today we are going to focus on this event. Uh, R for Reproducible Scientific Documents, and we're going to talk about how you can use R to support a reproducible workflow in your own environment. This is going to be a relatively short, more of a talky kind of workshop than a code type of workshop. Um, hope, hopefully we'll run about an hour, and um, I'm going to get started there. But before we get into the into the session itself, I'm going to give a little bit of housekeeping. So um, here are some links. They're also in the description below, um, but just so you have them on the screen here. The workshops page that I'm looking at right now and referring to is libcal.rutgers.edu slash NBL workshops. And you can see what's offered there. You can sign up for live events. Um, you can see listings of some of the events that we're starting to get back to in person. Um, another innovation that is starting, not a, a, a small listserv that is called NBL Data uh, that you can sign up for at this link um, if you are interested in getting uh, direct announcements about upcoming workshops or data-related events. It's really not going to be high volume. Um, typically a couple of times a semester, the major workshop listings, and possibly a couple of other special events uh, that come out. So if you are interested in following what the New Brunswick libraries are offering relating to data, this would be a place to go. And you can just sign up online. Standard mailman listserv. Um, so I'm going to close those windows because that's all I'm going to say about those. And now I'm going to go to the first link here, which is my GitHub page for the Tidyverse approach. GitHub.com slash Ryan Data slash Tidyverse underscore approach. And this is where we have been archiving the materials for this entire series. Uh, today I'm going to focus on reproducibility. And there is a folder here that says reproducible that has a few of the um, files that we are actually going to generate as we as we go through. Um, those are maybe for your future reference uh, to compare with things you might try out on your own. I'm primarily going to talk from the R for reproducibility.md page, the markdown page that renders um, on GitHub in a simple format. So as I said, I, I, I want to kind of talk through a, a number of concepts here. I'm going to move relatively quickly um, in the interest of keeping this short and give you the springboard through these links to explore further. So, and it, you know, if any of these concepts are familiar to you, I encourage you to use your video feature to speed up, scan through, or slow down and pay attention to the parts that are of interest to you. So what is reproducibility? Um, this is a concept that has really been gaining a lot of momentum in the last 10 years or so. And essentially we are talking about the ability to repeat a scientific experiment or a finding. Now, of course, repeating and verifying experiments has been a feature of science for hundreds of years. Um, so there is a distinction between what's typically called replication, which is if you have a physical experiment to 
redo the physical experiment from scratch. And that may not be possible in all circumstances due to cost or sometimes just due to the passage of time. Like if we have observed historical weather patterns, we can't make that happen again just to run an experiment. Uh, reproducibility, on the other hand, is focused on the computational aspects of research, um, which obviously have become increasingly important in recent years. So when we have data and we have code that's used to analyze it, we want to be able to take that original data and rerun the analysis again and find similar results. We don't want to see the results dependent on some unknown or mysterious tweaks or things that happened uh, as the analysis went on that weren't recorded uh, that are going to cause other researchers to not be able to find the same results, not be able to reproduce the results. So here we have um, one uh, major case is kind of interesting um, if you if you if you get into this uh, one of the events that kind of kicked off a lot of this interest in ensuring reproducibility is there was essentially a case of research fraud that happened out of Duke um, and the Research was major uh, cancer-related research that was getting millions of dollars of uh, research funding. And some statisticians actually started to sniff around the data and were a bit suspicious of the way that the, you know, the random error of observations seemed to be awfully regular to be random and things like that. Um, and then started to ask for verification. And when they couldn't get the verification, became more alarmed. And uh, basically, the whole uh, story kind of came out. The uh, lead researcher, uh, interestingly enough, um, had lied about other things, had lied about being a Rhodes Scholar. Um, and this case eventually went to 60 Minutes. Uh, Duke had to repay millions of dollars of research funds. Um, it was kind of a big deal. So the if you want to read more about that, uh, I've got a couple of links there for you. But that, that's a famous example of where not having reproducible results gets you into trouble. Um, there's also an issue of Science Magazine special issue uh, devoted to um, to reproducibility, which the link I have not, I'm going to need to update. Looks like um, I I was not thinking that would change, but that has changed since the last time I did this. I'm not going to rerun the video here, but I will fix that link uh, before uh, I upload the video. So that'll be. Uh, corrected for you. Uh, anyway, there was this whole special issue about 2014, 2015, with many interesting articles on aspects of reproducibility in different scientific disciplines uh, that also kind of set a focus on this. So that's all I'll say about the background of why this is important in general. And we want to kind of hone in on for uh, a user with an R workflow, uh, what are some of the lessons that we can take from this and uh, use to make our data more reproducible? So the uh, first thing I would say is that we, we start out with fundamental concepts of data management, right? So data management simply refers to how you are taking care of your data. And if you have good practices for your data management, uh, you are uh, helping yourself by just being better organized and and uh, saving time and energy yourself by having nice, clean, organized data. But you're also making your data uh, more understandable to others every time you take steps in this direction. 
So some of the major points, this is not a data management pre presentation, so per se, there are a lot of good ones out there. Um, the libraries have a, Rutgers libraries have a libguide on data management that you could, would be a starting place. Um, I think I'll link that here as well. So by the time you see this video, this page will also have that data management uh, link. Uh, lots of other libraries and other places have great guides for that. But so very briefly, the major principles. Okay, you have your raw data. Typically your, your raw data is uh, time consuming or expensive to collect. Keep it safe, keep it separate, keep it unmodified. Uh, before you start working on the data yourself. If you decide to delete or modify a variable um, on your original data file, this is bad news if you ever want to go back um, and do something different. It's also bad news for the other researchers who want to take a look and say, what was the raw data? Um, so simple thing to do, but just remember to do it. Keep the raw data separate. Uh, every time you touch the data and modify it, put it in a separate directory. Um, you want to document your variables and your data collection. So in some fields, this is a code book in the social sciences, maybe a listing of all the variables and all the values they might take, how things were coded uh, in, the, in the data set. A data dictionary uh, often is a spreadsheet that lists the variables in a similar form, um, or at a minimum, a readme that explains what the layout of the data is and the perhaps the naming structure of the variables. Um, these are well understood conventions. When someone goes in to your project directory, they are looking for something like that to understand where to get started what does it all mean? And this is also good for you because if you come back to a project three years later or more, you know, you might say, gee, I'm interested in, in revisiting that, doing it as a, an extension of it, a modification. And you go back and look at something that you never properly described the variables. You used abbreviations that made sense to you at that time. And then you start to wonder, well, am I sure what that abbreviation means? When I entered this variable, was I um, looking at it? What was the time period of data collection? Was it a, you know, a full month or two, or was it something, something else? All of those details about how your data was collected and formatted and described, it's a lot easier to do that when you start your project than to try to reconstruct it later. So that's another thing you want to do. Uh, for uh, the best reproducibility, you also want to use a coding framework for manipulating your data. So it could be R, it could be Python, it could be other things. Um, if your data manipulation steps are documented in code, then you you already have a record of everything that happened. Another researcher can't come in and say, well, how did you clean that data? It, it'll be recorded in the code. If you do something in a manual point and click type environment like Excel, um, you can run into a lot of trouble if you, you know, you took a step to clean extreme values or um, remove some outliers and then you know you you didn't write that down exactly how you did that um, what steps were taken and so again when someone else goes and looks at the data they may not be able to reproduce it understand what you did with it and they will start to question and this you know this can lead to things that are not good in terms of uh, reputation in terms of um, sometimes, you know, articles need to be withdrawn if there are severe data problems. Um, certainly if data can't be found um, to answer certain questions, this kind of stuff happens, right? So another good, good principle to think about. Um, and then, you know, keeping your data in a nice directory structure, a separate project for every 
every a separate directory for every data project, a separate directory for raw data, a separate directory for processed data or manipulated data, a separate directory for code, a separate directory for graphs, a separate directory for any kind of reports or output that's generated. If you use a structure like that, that will help everyone, including yourself, who's looking at the data to understand what is happening where. And R, now we'll start to get into some of the R examples. And we have some tools that can be used in R to generate these kind of things automatically, right? So there's a, there's a package called project template that you can just run it and it'll produce a default uh, directory structure for you. Um, it also has the ability to do a lot of customization. Like if you, if you have a favorite um, style that you want to use for your directories, uh, it can support that. Um, and, you know, essentially, it's if you use it just in a default manner, it's going to um, produce a, a, a simple and st standardized directory structure. Okay, this is what I was looking for. So something like, like this with um, data, diagnostics, graphs, reports, etc. Right. So this kind of structure um, that can be used from project to project that can help make your code be more um, reusable as you're doing multiple projects. There are a lot of benefits to this kind of approach. Um, so just I just wanted to show you that as one our example of putting this into practice. All right. So that's all I'm going to say about data management. Probably said too much already about that. Um, now we're kind of moving f further down the, the line of more advanced reproducibility. So the next concept is literate programming. Literate programming, uh, we know that when we write code, we want to comment the code, put in explanations so that other people coming in to reuse, edit, read, and understand the code later can understand what each chunk of code is doing. Um, we want to ideally work in an environment that supports that style of commenting your code. So things like Mathematica notebooks, um, Jupyter notebooks uh, for Python and other languages are examples of this where, you know, in a Jupyter notebook, we, we have the ability to have lots of text to explain what's happening in the various code chunks and build a whole narrative of how a particular project or analysis works. In R, uh, we can directly format documents um, that support literate programming. So the classic uh, way this has been done and still can be done is LaTeX and Sweeve or Sweeve um, is a an R package that essentially allows you to insert uh, pieces of R code into your LaTeX code um, using uh, specially labeled files called RNW files, R no web files. Um, the, you know, the details of this implementation are, if LaTeX is not familiar to you, don't worry about it. Um, but if, if you are a LaTeX user, this is a good way to get the power of uh, running some R code directly in your LaTeX um, and doing things like automatically inserting the results of your analysis um, and, you know, kind of generating this very integrated environment. So in this very brief example, um, this section that's set off by these funny 
characters, this cluster of less than and greater than signs and ending with the ats um, are a chunk of R code that is going to get inserted into the LaTeX document when you compile it. Um, so, you know, you can read about that. Um, I actually encourage you to do so, but, you know, LaTeX itself is a bit more of a heavyweight um, project. The, the advantage of using LaTeX is that you have the full formatting options of LaTeX. You can do a full scientific paper. You can do your bibliographies and include the R code in it. Uh, what we're going to look at in an actual example in just a minute is the lighter version of this, which is Knitter plus either Markdown or R Markdown. So Knitter is the package that enables this to happen. You have to have Knitter installed in R. Um, and you can write documents in either Markdown or R Markdown. I'll talk about that a bit more in just a second. So the the whole idea here is, as we've already mentioned, we can embed the R code. Um, we can eliminate mistakes of, gee, I copied and pasted in the wrong table, or hey, I updated my data, um, and now I've got to remember, oh, that, that affects table four in the paper. I've got to go and update table four. When you're always running from the data itself, you never have to worry about that, right? Your your revised data is going to get compiled into the new table um, automatically. And you can run uh, this code in different ways so that you can extract the code itself. Uh, the code is where that's included in the text is referred to as tangled. Um, this is why there's, you know, it's S weave, weaving and tangling. Um, when we generate the final document, we weave together or knit together the text and the code to generate a document. But we can also run it the other way and just extract the code so we can have a nice clean code file. Um, so this always ensures that the latest data results are actually incorporated. We've already said that. Um, and because we've got the code in the document, you know, that we have the option to display the code if we'd like to make the final document very explicit. Uh, we can also simply provide the raw file for those who are um, literate in these conventions to go and inspect, right? So we can see the code that generated the results in the paper that helps us make everything more transparent. Uh, another nice benefit, side benefit, is that if you write in these formats, it becomes very easy to generate multiple outputs. PDF, documents, HTML is like a one-click uh, thing from uh, one foundational document. And just also mentioning along the way, there's a package called Format R um, that helps to clean up your R code um, sort of tidy it up to sort of standard uh, indents and things like that. Things that actually do not matter in R the same way they matter in Python, but um, for something to look nice and be very understandable, it's nice to actually process it according to these norms. Okay, so I am going to talk about the, the stuff in these bullets, but I think I've talked enough, so let's actually go into... R Studio and take a closer look at the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. I'm going to um, enlarge my font here a bit, zoom in a bit so that everything is nice and um, easy to see, even if that means that I can't easily find the OK button. OK, there we go. Um, so I want to go into my documents and 
find my R stuff. Okay, so this is just a sort of messy R directory that I have some things in. So we are in R Studio, which we have been using in other sessions. And I'm really just going to do some basic examples here to show you how this works. We can go to File, New File, and when we do New File, right, we can do the things that we have been done to doing before, like our script. Uh, we can do our sweeve or sweeve, your preferred pronunciation. Um, and we can do markdown. And I'm going to do our markdown for this example um, because it, it generates a, a sort of little sample that's a little bit nicer. So if you want to get a feel for this, just do file, new, our markdown. Um, and I'm just going to say um, test knit. Um, and actually, it doesn't matter what your default output format is here because you can switch back and forth to others. Um, PDF, just to mention that um, you know you need if for a Word document you need to have something that reads a Word document. For PDF, you have to have a PDF installation on your system, um, which is a bit burdensome to do in Windows, but um, that's, a, again, a kind of separate topic. But if you have PDF, um, a, a tech installation, like you're using LaTeX already on your machine, uh, this should work without a problem. Um, otherwise, you know, you can Google a little bit to um, find where these packages live and install, you know, the whole uh, setup on your system. HTML should always work uh, on any system without any special treatment. Okay, so I have started up the sample document. Um, and I'll say a little bit about Markdown versus our Markdown. So, right, so Markdown, you may have heard of Markdown. Uh, Markdown is a very nice and simple language to use to do things like format web pages and documents um, in a very minimalistic sort of language. And R Markdown is really almost the same thing. There are just tiny differences between them. Um, you know, I, it really depends on if you're using a lot of R code, R Markdown is probably going to be easier to work with within R Studio. If you want something that is more generically compatible, um, you can use a Markdown file. Markdown files end with .md by convention. R Markdown is dot capital R MD. Um, and for example, the um, this page is a regular Markdown file because regular Markdown files get formatted nicely on GitHub. So I tend to use those there. Um, so we have a sort of a title block that is set off by these little dashes. And this is the thing about the Markdown family of formats is these just very simple little um, conventions uh, format the document, right? It's, it's not like HTML where we have to have very specific tags. We just have this pretty simple stuff. So these this three dashes are um, title block. Uh, this first chunk between 8 and 10 is a little setup thing. It's more of a technicality. So I'm going to skip over that right now. And we're going to talk more about, about that in just a moment. So I have just waiting for my phone to go to voicemail there, sorry. Um, we have a text section called R Markdown where we can write some text. Uh, the hashtags set the level of header. So we can uh, have multiple levels by just increasing the number of hashtags. Um, we 
And this is one of the, you know, sort of easy formatting principles here. We can throw in links with very simple syntax, just these little brackets. Um, and that's the text side of Markdown. You can, you can Google for a Markdown quick guide and, and pick up these tricks very simply. Um, bulleted lists and bolds and italics and stuff. It's very simple. Um, actually, this is bold here. This um, two asterisks uh, around a word. And the difference between this and Markdown, right, is obviously we have some R code. So the R code comes in with these three little back ticks, and it also ends with three more back ticks. Uh, the R inside the curly brackets is letting the software know that what's inside this little chunk is R code. And the cars part is just a name, right? So we can just name different sections of our code for easy reference. Um, this would be fine if it was just like this, however. Um, and so inside those those little triple uh, backtick segments, we have some R code. In this case, just a very simple summary statement. Um, we can plot as well, and I'll, I'll show that in just a second. So the nice thing about RStudio is we have these little evaluation figure uh, tools that we can do. We can just press the sort of play button to run the chunk and see what happens. All right, so here the summary of the cars data set, which is something built into our very standard um, example, uh, generates these summary results. We can, I'll, I'll get into the settings again in just a minute. So when we, when we run a plot, we can just press play and generate the plot. Okay, now this is great. We're seeing this on screen. Um, I was promising you that these could be nice documents though as well. So to do that, all I need to do is press the knit button and I can knit to various formats. If I knit to HTML, it's going to ask me um, first for a name to save the document, but then it will process that file and show me in HTML form, right? So here it is. Uh, my header, my title information is up there. My header information is a larger size. It's been bolded. And my link is in place. And my code and results are also displaying. So this is really all there is to it, right? Is it's a nice way to quickly generate um, nicely, simply formatted documents that include executed R code. Um, and this, I won't click the open in browser. Well, why not? I'll click. Well, that's why I didn't want to click open in browser because my computer has some odd defaults to it. Um, anyway, this would normally open in a browser and pretty much look the same the same way. Um, other options we have are, um, as is noted in the text, uh, when we go and do this plot, we have this echo equals false. Echo refers to is the code itself echoed. Um, if I say echo equals true, which is actually the default, um, and I knit this again, you'll see it shows me the command. Right. But if I want to suppress the command, as I could in the first segment up here, I can say echo equals false. And I'm, I'm pressing that play button. I really don't need to do that. It does that automatically when we knit it. Right. So now I've just got the results with without the code. I can echo the code, but not evaluate the, the results themselves, right? So if I just want to print out some code without showing the results, um, actually that's, that's not evaluate, but let me, um, go 
gone a little too far there. Yeah, so if I want to show um, show the code only, that's still well. Okay, so I'm I'm getting a little uh, confused here because the um, The, what I what I really want to do I'm just reading the um, the options incorrectly what I want to do is I'd like to show nothing um, and not run the code so this eval equals false is is the right setting for that now let's let's generate that So now I've actually got nothing displaying. Anyway, you can tweak these these settings, right? To ev either evaluate the code. Sometimes you want to, you don't want to run the code in every case. Uh, to include the code or not. Um, if I include the code but don't run it, this is actually what I was originally looking for, was just to print out the code, right? So if I just wanted to print some code without any results, I could include it but not evaluate it so these options give you a number of different combinations that you can use to display or not display run or not run your code um, and that is is actually and this is where i was getting in trouble right because i've forgotten that i had included put this include equals false statement in my uh, text already So, all right, so I've been doing all this on HTML. I want to just show you that we can easily also uh, knit to PDF. Now, the thing about the PDF is that, uh, actually, I, yeah, that looks all right. Let's go back to evaluate equals true here. Um, just so we have something more interesting there. Uh, the PDF doesn't display by default. So what it's actually doing is it's throwing that into my data directory down here. So I can uh, collect collect it from my, my local directory and open it up and take a look at what that looks like. And you can see that's a... Um, latex style uh, PDF document and along the way it's generating these intermediate files as well um, there's the testnet RMD um, and if we are if we really want to get fancy right we can take these output formats and pass them through something like pandoc which is a good tool at least in Linux to go from any format to another um, and convert these into LaTeX direct, directly, like if we want to do more fancy things with it after this initial step, um, we have those options. Uh, and then the final knitting that I'll do is to just to show you the knit to Word, um, just to prove to you that that works. Uh, we have a docx format here and that may take a moment to open up. Um, doesn't seem to be wanting to open up by default. Again, my setup is a bit quirky, so let me try this one more time. interesting so a moment ago this was popping up oh I see I, this um, 
Uh, I think it's opened up, but in another window somewhere. I'm not going to try to hunt it down on my system. But um, the the document format also works pretty well. I, I just don't want to spend time in the video version hunting around with the idi idiosyncrasies of my uh, system. All right. So I think you get this the idea of what's going on here. Um, we, we have also the, the code options, right? We can run the chunks. Um, we can just use this as an R uh, code editing environment with some text around it to make it literate programming. But having that option to just directly give, get a nice document at any moment is, I think, a big uh, plus. I'm just wondering if some of my output options might be influencing my uh, word display. All right, so this is the basic idea of the the knitting process. Um, I'm going to go back to our uh, web page just to make sure that I've covered the points in these bullets, and then we're going to talk about a couple of other topics um, to to move forward. All right, so we talked about Knitter, the package. We talked about R Markdown. Um, the, the math formatting of mathematical equations is another area where R Markdown might do a little better than regular Markdown. Um, the integration into R Studio and the simple syntax are big pluses. Um, and the one thing I haven't showed you yet, which I will show you now, is the ability to publish documents directly from our studio. Uh, I didn't mention explicitly before, but uh, if you are starting with a fresh installation and you click knit, it's probably going to ask you to install a bunch of packages. You can just go ahead and do that, and then you'll be ready to go. The same is true for this R pubs. This little icon of the sort of swirly blue icon is a publishing icon. And if you click there, uh, it might ask you the first time you do it to install a couple of helper packages. But once you have done that, you'll have this option to publish directly to our pubs, which is a website um, that publicly makes things available. Um, OK, now I need to um, knit it back to HTML. Let me do that. And now hit publish. Uh, it'll ask you to log in to the RPUB site. You have to create an account there. I'm already logged in here, but um, I can actually add some description. So a lot of actually um, homework, you, homework assignments in that are using R and stuff uh, actually use this workflow to ask the students to post their things online. It's an easy way to kind of collect and make sure that they've done everything. Um, so if you've you might have seen this before in that context. Um, now you can see this is the same old HTML that we uh, have been looking at. Nothing exciting there, but it is on the web um, at the RPubs site. So um, that's one option. The other thing to note about that publishing process is this second option for publishing that um, they give you R Studio Connect is something that uh, if there's a local or corporate installation of R um, if you have a server to connect to um, this uh, can publish the documents to that directory on the server, which might be a corporate server um, or a departmental server or something like that. Um, so the same workflow can be used uh, for you know specific applications of that kind. Um, beyond that, you know, just the fact that it's giving you standard HTML or PDF output means you can take those files and just drop them anywhere and they would be very accessible. Okay, so that's, um, you know, 
the fact that all these features are built into the RStudio environment, I think makes them really easy to take advantage of. Um, and I would encourage you if you're if you're working in R to you know to do that to take advantage of those those features. All right. Um, so our remaining sections, uh, we're going to talk about how to go even further down the road of reproducibility. So even if you've got your data organized, you've made your data available, it's all well documented, it's cleanly organized, um, there's still an issue with reproducing results. And that is sometimes the versions of the software matter, right? So the implementation of a particular procedure might change, the syntax might change over time. Um, and often with commercial software, it's very difficult to kind of go back and get a working version of SPSS 8 or something when SPSS is on 23 or you know some much higher version number now. Open source is actually great for this purpose because even though most people don't use them, the earlier versions of the software are still sitting around on the you know the um, repository servers, and anyone can grab that exact version for compatibility. Um, so there are a couple of packages that automate this process in R that are called Checkpoint and Packrat. Um, you you can use Checkpoint to take a snapshot of your system and show everything, you know, I'm using version 2.31 of ggplot2. I'm not sure if that's a correct number. I'm just making that up off the top of my head. I'm using version 0.95 of some other package at the time I'm doing this analysis, right? So someone knows that if they want to reproduce it exactly, they have to grab those packages. These two uh, packages together can enable you to easily do that. Um, the Microsoft R um, repository um, has, and I need to enable some stuff here, um, has snapshots of, you know, complete snapshots of older versions of R, right? So if we, we want to go back um, to you know, R 3.3, um, we can do, we can do that. And this is going to continue to kind of be build, built and maintained over time. So it's a, as they call it now, the CRAN time machine. It's part of the Microsoft R application network. Um, this article um, describes um, some of the things that you would want to consider uh, when you're developing a um, an approach to this, right? So Checkpoint actually um, lets you link to that Microsoft site. Um, Packrat is more of a standalone kind of um, capturing each, each package. Um, and this page gives you an idea of um, the trade-off that you make, which is either you're investing time to set these things up in advance and making it easier for others, or you don't do much of that, but you make it much harder for others to reproduce your, your work. Um, and it will give you some advice about how to use Packrat or uh, Checkpoint um, effectively. So I don't want to go into detail in that in this brief talk, but those are definitely things to consider. Uh, I do want to run this other command that's mentioned here, this session info command, which this is a, a quick and easy way to um, capture some information. And I would recommend doing that and storing that somewhere um, for, you know, at a key stage of a project you're working on. Uh, so this is my session info right now, um, my R version, my platform, um, the versions of packages that I've currently got loaded, um, 
things like that, right? So these are all things that could affect how something might run in the future. So it's a good idea to grab that. Um, going beyond that, let me just capture the listing of packages. Um, you can do containerized solutions, right? So you may have heard of things like Docker. Um, Singularity is more of an open source approach to that. Um, and ReproZip, which is mentioned here, is a specific um, containerized type solution that's really geared to reproducibility first. Um, so those are all potential projects. This again is not, this talk is not going to get into that, but definitely things to consider. Uh, what that containerized solution does is you basically take your entire um, current system setup that is used to generate your analysis and you just bundle it into something that someone else can unzip and launch themselves later, right? So the bundling of all the correct packages has already been done by the inside the containerized environment. Um, and those solutions, I think, are be be getting easier over time. Okay, um, so that's package management. Definitely something to consider. Uh, another thing to, to consider for reproducibility in the long term is um, specifically creating packages that encompass um, all the stuff that others are going to need to reproduce your analysis or do similar kinds of analysis. So this is basically, what am I talking about? I'm talking about our packages, right? Um, is one way to do that, right? So the, the um, you can create an R package. It's obviously well understood in the R domain what is what a package does. You can use a package just to distribute data if you want to. Um, but also your documentation and the functions that you used to analyze it, you can you can record those and and put them into package form. Um, so the um, a, creating a package in R that might be actually a, an interesting topic for a future workshop uh, is fairly straightforward. A, an R package. Um, is simply a directory that has some standardized information in it, right? So it's a directory that has um, a place for the code, a place for the data, a place for the documentation of the functions themselves, right? So it's got that help information. Um, and we can use things like, actually, I'm not going to go further on this link, but we can use things like this package skeleton command if we want to do it manually, or we can use RStudio itself. Now, so now we're going to do something different in RStudio. Again, just as a brief illustration, um, if I say I would like to generate a new I can't do this as a single file, right? So uh, as I said, a package is a whole directory. So I'm going to say new project. Um, let's put it in a new directory. And we're going to say we want to generate an R package, right? We saw this also. We can use this for Shiny, um, as we saw in previous sessions. Um, but I'm going to. Um, just pop this into my R directory in my complicated file system. Um, let's put it in a new directory called just new package. Okay, so here's the new package directory. Um, package name, I'm going to call it new package, and I'm going to create that project. And my RStudio kind of reset itself to this package space, right? And so I've got one function in, in this package. This is the template that RStudio 
uses, which is a hello world function. Um, and basically what I want to do is look more at the directory structure, right? So the directory structure has um, this R project file, which kind of, we don't really edit that very much. We just um, let R do the organization uh, of the project via that file. Uh, we have a namespace, which is a technicality that we don't worry about. We have this R build ignore, which is another technicality we don't worry about. The description is the top level description of the package, right? So when, when I say, um, get me some help on a particular package like ggplot2, um, if I'm, maybe I'm not remembering my, there we go. Yeah, so I don't know why that didn't work for ggplot2, but the, the top level package information. So here's the, the graphics package lattice, and you can see it's this same very standard format, right? It's got just a few fields, um, when it was updated, who's the author, what does it depend on, um, things like that. And my description here is just is the same thing, right? Whatever I edit this description to be would be the thing that shows up when someone looks at the help for that package. Um, so I can put my name in here. I can put the title, nothing package, um, description does almost nothing at all, right? Things like that. And we can, we can save that. And that's our description. Uh, in the R folder, we have our R functions, right? So this is very, this is what we were just looking at. This is the hello.r script. And it's just an R function, nothing uh, new there for people who have been coding in R for a bit. Uh, the man folder is where our R documentation files uh, come in. So this is a new format we haven't seen yet. Not RMD, but RD for R documentation. And when we go here, this is, it's just a markup, a slightly specialized markup language for um, for these functions, right? So the usage name of the function, hello. We might have other title information, things like that. Um, and we say uh, description, prints, hello world. I'm just gonna make an edit so that you can see that this is live and working. Um, if I say question mark, hello, um, actually, I haven't loaded this package. I haven't compiled the package and loaded it. So uh, this would be the kind of thing that would show up when we did have a question mark. It would show up formatted in um, this kind of format, right? So the description corresponds to what's in the description field over here. Um, the usage would be the valid formats of the command, and we can input all this other extra information like examples, like um, details, arguments of the, of the file, just by doing this kind of slash notation. Um, well, actually, we can preview it right there. There we go. That's I was trying to do it sort of the full way, but we can preview it and see what it looks like in the preview pane there, just, just the same. So creating a package, right, you can kind of see now that creating a package is nothing fancy. It is simply throwing in the correct files into a, a directory in a specific structure. That's all we do. And when we are ready to compile a package, there are tools for that. Um, which are under 
build. Yeah, so build, we want to test the package. This is going to check whether there's documentation for everything, whether the syntax of the functions passes some basic checks. Um, testing and checking are things you'll want to do. And then you can build the source package to which basically just bundles this directory into the format that R understands for installation. So all those tools are there in front of you in RStudio to go from file, new project, and then asking for a package, uh, to writing and filling in the, the folders, to then going under build to testing, checking, and, and building the package. Um, so definitely something to think about. The um, book, R Packages, is freely available online and it has all the, of the details that I am skimming over here. I definitely encourage you to have a look at that. Um, I might be having a temporary internet outage here. My internet tends to uh, flip out and reboot once in a while. Although it looks like I could get to our open side. So just this um, our packages book link is a little slow. Um, our open side is a collection of our packages that are very focused on issues of reproducibility and other uh, kind of related data management issues. So I highly, highly encourage you to look at this site for um, lots of helpful packages. We were just talking about publishing our data via packages and you can see this is going to have um, very specific helper, helper packages for things like large data on a GitHub repository, working with Figshare, um, there's just a ton of interesting stuff here. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but our OpenSci, uh, definitely take a look at that. That has a lot of great tools uh, available. Um, and yeah, so definitely having some problems with that one page. Okay, so now we are to the really the very last section, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes here um, so we, we've kind of scaled up from working in our own individual directories to ways that we can organize that and write literate code and share it. Um, and we're kind of going in this, in this direction towards maximum sharing, right? So the, the forces that we see in the computing world, cloud computing, shared platforms, convergence on standards are, are making collaboration anywhere across the globe much easier than ever before, sort of continuously getting easier. Um, coding tools, I, I haven't even linked to coding tools in this um, on this page, but you know there are a lot of shared coding tools as well that are developing in all different directions. Um, so you can use tools to collaborate on your programming like GitHub, Bitbucket, and others um, that have easy built-in collaboration, version control. Um, and because, you know, people use them for collaboration, they use them just to kind of distribute their code. But the side benefit is that reproducibility is sort of automatically supported and built in because most of these platforms are enabled for public sharing of code and all of the historical versions and all those things that we alluded to could be trouble. Um, we have an easy way to get the information out via these tools so that that doesn't happen. Um, so those are, you know, GitHub is like, you know, general tool, wide, widely available. We have some data specific tools. There are many of them. I'm not going to focus on any uh, in depth, but I do want to mention um, Open Science Framework, which is a publicly available uh, free platform to organize your data. 
Um, you can create an account and share data here. Um, oh, terrible typo. Um, let me try that again. And you can see that this has been used uh, 17,000 results uh, mentioning statistics somewhere. Um, I'm just sort of randomly looking at these. Let me take a look at this one. Turkish German bilingual speakers. Um, obviously a research study that um, is using the OSF framework to make the material available. And OSF has all these nice practices of giving you nice regular directory structures, um, a well laid out environment so that anyone coming to a, a page that has been filled in relatively completely like this one um, can see what a study was about, what supporting material there is, what data there is. See here's this is just a CSV file for the data but it because it's it's embedded in this structure we can easily see how it connects to the other um, elements of this research. So that's, you know, OSF is one of the, the big ones in this space, but um, there are many, many other places that enable you to share data in a very, um, very good way. If you want to discover those, there is a website that is always a challenge for me to pronounce. Um, the three is referring to the Registry of Research Data Repositories, but some people pronounce this as res data. And you can search here for repositories on any topic, um, and it's going to give you worldwide many, many, many different repositories um, that are pretty well described and, and categorized. So finding data repositories, just dig in here. Uh, you can see there are also many different filters you can use on the type of um, restrictions you'd like to see on that data. Okay, we've already seen um, this use of the project function in R, but specifically the RStudio has tools that let you integrate with GitHub, with PackRat, which we mentioned before is tracking, and other things. Um, so you can you can do GitHub snapshots of your stuff when you're working in our studio if if you want to stay in that environment. You can't really export it easily, um, but that's also worth mentioning. Okay, so we've we've seen that that view going from again the basic data management on up through um, super worldwide collaboration and maximum package uh, package control and version control. Let me say it that way. Um, if you want more, uh, the final links I'm going to throw at you here are there is a task view, right? So the CRAN, the R repository, has task views which describe the packages that are used in different fields. There's a whole one for reproducible research that will talk about uh, a few of the packages I've talked about here, but several others. Um, and you can keep up to date by exploring here. Um, it is uh, human curated and is focusing on the things that are most useful. So definitely something to check out. Um, if you were interested, we, we also talked about uh, Markdown, but Markdown can be used in, in even more extensive contexts. So in particular, there is a package called Blogdown that lets you build a blog from Mark, our Markdown files and Bookdown, which lets you build books out of our Markdown files, uh, including a lot of fairly well-known ones, the ones on this list. Um, the, and if you've seen this kind of free R book online, this is done by that uh, book down package, right? That gives you the navigation through the chapters, gives you really nice uh, formatting and organization. All right, 
so that's just you know markdown doesn't have to be used only for simple and small projects it can be used for quite big projects um, and I am going to end it there I hope this has been informative um, I hope this has been useful to you guys uh, who are watching and I hope you enjoy exploring R and building up your skills in reproducibility and using them out in the world. Uh, thank you for your attention.